Good morning. You wouldn't believe it how good it is to see all of you and be here in the Lord's house. So um, we haven't heard from Junior and LaDonna Haley in a while, but um, they've been going through the same things we have here with all the COVID and shutdowns and reopenings and social distancing. And um, But there's been many blessings that they've gone through as well. It says, we have some big news from Ghent Baptist Church. God has really blessed us and our church has moved into a new building. We've not purchased this building, but have had to move to a new rental property. I want to be transparent about that and why we made this move, especially since many of you have labored with us in prayer over a new building or even given towards purchasing a building. The money that has been given towards purchasing a building is still designated to that cause, and we are still diligently searching for a more permanent home for our church. As much as this move is an answer to prayer and a cause for celebration, we greatly request your continued prayer for finding a building to purchase. Currently, we've only signed a three-year contract on this new property. This building is not our destination, but a necessary stop on the journey. The cause for us having to move is really simple. Our church has outgrown our previous building over a year and a half ago, before coronavirus even hit. Since then, like most churches, we've had a period we've had to regain stability after the initial lockdown. However, God has blessed our church and for some time have been growing and seeing the Lord do a great work here in Belgium. That is to say that our building was too small before we were required to meet social distancing and restrictions. We had, tried to, we had tried to adjust to these restrictions by renting the conference room of a local hotel for our Sunday morning services. That hotel has now been closed since before Christmas. And after scouring the city multiple times, a suitable replacement couldn't be found. This put us in a hard place. We've maxed out our capacity and have been having to hold three different Sunday morning services to allow everyone to be able to be in church on Sundays. Also, not having a large enough building for our own uh, to meet and not having a reliable or consistent place for our church to meet. In addition to this, coronavirus has devastated the real estate market here and also caused most banks to forego loaning money. I went from viewing a suitable building once a week to having only found one suitable building in the past five months. So at the beginning of the year, I felt impressed by the Lord to pray about the potential of looking at rental properties, something I had set my heart that we wouldn't do. God, whoever humbled me on this cause and then brought this exciting property to us, a property that will allow us to be almost double the seating of our previous building. It will add to our church several needed facilities such as a nursery, fellowship hall, and entrance hall, office, kitchen, and much larger children's church. The location is credible right on the main road of the community and one of the biggest roads for the whole city. There are tram and bus stops directly in front of the building, and large bicycle paths all, all the way around from the center. There are three free parking lots one on each side of the building, and an entrance and exit onto the highway in front of the building as well. We had our first service there, April 11th, and it was overwhelming how blessed we were to be here with it. I cannot express how excited everyone was to actually have a church building. Please be sure to look forward to uh, more exciting news as we go forward in this new location. Let me give you my sincerest apologies. This letter was intended to reach you a month ago. Now that we are, now that you're aware of our big news, I hope you understand that for the past month I have worked at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week between renovating this property with the help of our church people and doing my regular work as pastor here. Look for pictures of the renovation process of the completed building and our first services in this new building in coming pages. Thank you all for your faithful prayers for us. You are much needed part of our ministry and, we'll, and you will never know how much of a blessing you are to us, at least on this house, on this at least on this side of eternity. With sincere gratitude, Brother Junior Haley. I think that's <clears throat> good news. We always look at you know, churches being closed and not being able to meet and you know all the social distancing and things that are pressed upon the church. And I don't know what they have for religious freedoms there in Belgium, but um, they, they outgrew their church even in, amidst the COVID and they're still going and growing further and further. So I'm... Uh, just astounded at that is how the Lord's hand has worked there. But let's uh, remember them in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful for the ministry here in Belgium with uh, Junior and LaDonna, uh, our missionaries, the Haley's, Lord. Um, Lord, we just are thankful for the blessings that they've had there, Lord. Lord, we know this terrible disease is throughout the world and each country treats it different. And yet, Lord, your hand is still mightily working there amongst the people, people are being saved. Your work goes forward, Lord, no matter what goes on in society, no matter what governments say, no matter what diseases are out there. 
Your hand still goes forward, still saving people, still using your people to reach the lost. Lord, just pray for many more blessings there. Just pray for permanent properties in the future for this church, Lord, that they may grow and, and eventually divide and, and more churches may grow there. Lord, just thank you for the part that we have in, in uh, the preaching and the teaching of the gospel to the unsaved in Belgium. We just pray for much fruit, Lord. Just praise in Jesus' name. Amen. a couple of announcements before I you can be turning in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 this morning 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and uh, next Sunday we want to begin our Sunday school back uh, that'll be May the 2nd uh, at 10 o'clock so you're going to have to be here an hour earlier okay but next Sunday we want to start Sunday school back and then two weeks away, ladies, mark your calendars. There's a ladies' luncheon on s Saturday, May the 8th at 12 o'clock. And um, uh, missionary Honora Dietrich will be here. She'll be the guest speakers for the ladies. Ladies, you want to be here. Uh, it, it, I'm sure it's going to be a blessing. Uh, Honora has uh, a lot of life experiences. She's a very young lady. But a lot of life experiences, and I'm sure uh, that you'll be blessed. Um, they're calling it a spring refresher. So if you look in your bulletins and see how that's spelled, it's a refresh her, okay? So ladies, uh, sign up as soon as possible. I'm assuming there's a sign-up sheet out there to sign up with. There's a sign-up sheet on the table. And uh, two weeks away, so make sure that you sign up for that. And then, I'm looking forward to our first picnic this year. And it'll be on Sunday, May the 30th. And, of course, that's going to be uh, weather permitting. And all of our picnics were canceled last year. Uh, but we're looking forward this year to uh, getting back and, and having our picnics. And so May the 30th. And... Um, picnic and and I'm, I'm possibility maybe we'll go outside and have service on that day if if the weather's permitting we'll just have make a whole day of it on the outside uh, but mark that down and then please don't forget our missions conference coming up now I know it's it's a little bit of ways off it's uh, October the 13th through Sunday the 17th uh, but I uh, really want to emphasize missions this year. Folks, I appreciate you giving so much. Uh, our faith promise is, is beyond uh, schedule uh, for this time, which is good. We've got some wonderful missionaries that we, uh, that we support already. And I've got some really fine missionaries that are going to be coming and presenting their work uh, uh, between now and then as well. And uh, I, I want to take on more missionaries, but for us to be able to do that, uh, our faith promise is going to have to increase. We're ahead of schedule right now, and, and that's great, uh, but keep these things in prayer if you would. And then let me mention, too, I, I failed to mention uh, Brother Tom Shear uh, has been down as well, and uh, he's recovered, he's doing well, but... Uh, didn't feel like uh, he could be here today, but he's planning to be back next week. He's one of our Sunday school teachers as well. And uh, so, uh, so many uh, to pray for. And you may know some, some things that I don't know about. Uh, and if you do, you let me know about those things so we can be praying for them as well uh, this morning. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 20, if you would. And I've got quite a few verses that I want to read to you this morning. But to get the whole context of what I want to say, I'm going to read out of Second Chronicles 20. 
Then I'm going to get back up and give you some background to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and uh, hope that I'll be able to make sense out of all of this when we're said and done this morning. The Bible says in verse 1, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Uh, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and beyond they that be in Has Has and Antamar, which is in Angedi. And Je Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh Lord God, our fathers, uh, O oh Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen and in thine hand? Is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the, uh, to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, if when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house in, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt help us, hear and help us. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when thou came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them uh, at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, 
and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, and to say, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and to destroy them. When they had made an end of the, of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. And so what's happened, they be, the armies begin to fight against themselves and to destroy themselves. And when Judah came towards the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitudes, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. <clears throat> now, that's a lot of reading this morning. I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll introduce to you how I want to handle this passage today. Our Father... I thank you uh, for this passage in the life of King Jehoshaphat, the nation of Israel and Judah. And Father, now I pray that you'd speak truth from this Old Testament passage to us today in this age of the church in which we live. And help us, Father, to draw uh, truth to our own lives and Father, we'll thank you for what you do and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to understand what I think brought this battle about, you've got to go back all the way in um, to chapter 18, if you would, of Second Chronicles. And Ahab, Jehoshaphat is the king in Judah. Ahab is the king in Israel. And so uh, uh, Ahab is going to go to battle against Ramoth Gilead. And he sends for Jehoshaphat to get Jehoshaphat to go to battle with him. Well, Jehoshaphat agrees. He says, I am as you are, King Ahab, and my people are as your people. Folks, anybody see anything wrong with that? There is a ton of things wrong with that. Ahab is one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had. Jehoshaphat was a good king. Uh, it even says that uh, Je Jehoshaphat walked in the ways of his father Asa, and, uh, and he was a good king. It's, it's, it's mentioned. So, no, he wasn't a perfect king. There were no perfect kings except one. And that was Jesus. And Jehoshaphat had his faults. But, but by and large, he was a very good king. But he had his problems. Uh, I believe he had problems with compromise. He went to Ahab. Ahab, let's go to battle with Ramad Gilead. Oh, sure. I'm as you are. My people are as your people. Let's go. He said, but before we go, he's going to get real spiritual. He says, are there, not some, are there not some prophets that we can inquire? Uh, well, Ahab had lots of prophets. That was no problem. So he calls 400 prophets, and they all prophesy to Ahab and say, Oh, yeah, God is with you, Ahab. Go to it. And so Jehoshaphat standing there, well, and, and I think he recognizes that these guys aren't prophets of the Lord. He says, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire at? And Ahab says, yeah, there's one. There's one, but I hate him. Because he don't ever say anything good to me. But we'll call him and we'll see what he has to say. And so Micaiah, they call him. And they say, now, now Micaiah... 
Ahab's prophets, they've done prophesied good. Now, don't go against the flow. And I like what Micaiah says. What the Lord gives to me, that's what I'm going to say. If it hair lips the Pope, that's what I'm going to say. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And so he gets down to them and, 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 and Micaiah eventually says, you go out, but if you go, it's not going to be good. And, and, and so one of Ahab's prophets, they come and they slap Micaiah in the face. What do you mean? And Ahab says, I told you he wouldn't say anything good. Put him in prison. Feed him an affliction of, uh, 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 of bread and water until we come again in peace. And Micaiah says, if you come again in peace, then you'll know that's not, I, I didn't tell you the truth. You're going to die out there today, Ahab. And so they put Micaiah in prison and Ahab and Jehoshaphat, Israel and Judah, go to war against Ramoth Gilead. Now, Ahab, he's such, a, he's such a man of integrity. Jehoshaphat, you go out in your robes, but I'm going to disguise myself. Nobody will know who I am. And I don't know what's wrong with Jehoshaphat. Hey, listen, folks, when you start down that road of compromise, you, you're not going to know right from wrong. You're going to get stabbed in the back. And so they go to battle. And the Syrians say, now, we just want Ahab. We want the king of Israel. That's the only one we want. And so they go out into battle, and they see Jehoshaphat out there in his, his royal robes. There he is. Let's get him. And so they get down there, and they get around Jehoshaphat. And they, Jehoshaphat begins, Lord, help me. And, and God is so merciful, he helps Jehoshaphat. He just looks down in mercy, and they see it's not Ahab and and so they, they, they let Jehoshaphat go. And one of, the, one of the archers in the Syrian army, he just pulls back his bow and lets it go. And who do you guess it hits? Ahab. And Ahab dies. Now, we don't hear any more about what Micaiah says after that. But I, don't, I imagine he just sat there. I told you so. That's what I'd have said. <laughs> I told you so. And Jehoshaphat, he gets away and goes back to Judah. And so, then in chapter 19, uh, it, it, chapter 18 ends up, Ahab's dead. In chapter 19, and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee. So the prophet of the Lord, he comes at Jehoshaphat, What are you doing? What are you joining hands with those that hate the Lord for? Folks, if that's, not a, if that's not a passage about separation today, I don't know what is. And my message this morning is not about separation, but I can't help but bring that out at this point. There's a crisis that took place. And because of what took place, um, uh, the Lord is going to bring another battle. And this time it's coming Jehoshaphat's way. And I read that to you in chapter 20. Folks, there's a crisis coming in the nation of, Je of, of, of Judah, in Jehoshaphat's life. And folks, in our lives, crises are going to come. We've been in a crisis for the last month, it seems like, around here. I said Wednesday night to the folks who came to prayer meeting, but I believe it's an attack of the devil on this place. I really do. Every time I turned around, there was more bad news. I'd get a call, and, and then I'd get another call, and then I'd get another call, and then I'd get another call. At some point, I thought, Lord, what is going on here? We had a crisis. 
I think at one time we had like 11 people that had been, that had at least symptoms of this virus going around. And, and, and folks, we'd gone over a year and it'd been calm around here, nothing. And then all of a sudden, it seems like at one time, it came in on us. But how do we respond in a crisis? Folks, crisis is going to come in our lives. It don't matter if you're ungodly. It don't matter if you're godly. Crisis are going to come. And, and, and can I say, if you're godly, the crisis may come even more than the ungodly get. Yea, and all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's still in the Bible. The question is, how do we respond when it comes? Now, Jehoshaphat done some wrong. Now, Jehoshaphat, he's going to get through this, and he's going to compromise more in his life. But later, he's going to compromise with Ahaz, uh, 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 one of Ahab's sons. He's going to get through that, and a little later on, Jehoram's going to come, another one of uh, Ahab's son, and he's going to compromise with him. And they're going to go down to the prophet Elisha. And Elisha's going to say, listen, uh, Jehoram, I wouldn't even look your way if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat. But he keeps doing the wrong things. And God was merciful with him. James chapter 4 and verse 8 tells us to draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Listen, folks, in a time of crisis in our life, it's not a time to run to the enemy. It's a time to draw nigh to God. I'm going to tell you, folks, I believe with all my heart in the last month, my prayer life has been as strong as it's ever been my whole Christian life in the last month. And crisis has brought it about. And I don't know about your prayer life, but that's the way it's affected my prayer life. It has increased it. But hard times are going to come. In 1 Peter 4.12, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Boy, these are strange things going on around here. Well, we shouldn't think it's strange. Don't think it's strange, the fiery trial that's going to try you. Romans 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in you, in us. Hey, listen, folks. Don't think it's strange. The, the, the things that are happening to us, the sufferings of this present time, they're going to come. Hey, but look to the glory beyond. God's not finished yet. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Question, what will you do when the crisis comes? I'm going to give you several things that Jehoshaphat did. When the crisis came, number one, he prayed. Look at verses three and four again. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. They prayed, they proclaimed a fast. We're in prayer meeting Wednesday night, and somebody said, Preacher, should we not fast? We're praying, but shouldn't we fast also? And I said, Well, I'm not calling a, a church-wide fast. Oh, but if God would move your heart to fast, I believe it'd be a good thing. Say, how long? I don't know. Say, I can't fast for a day. Can you fast for a meal? Can you fast for two meals? Can you fast for three meals? Maybe the Lord would move you to fast for a day, two days, three Whatever the Lord would put into your heart to do. I think that's between you and the Lord. But I think we ought to pray. We ought to pray. You know, uh, I, 
I said my prayer life the last months, I probably prayed more the last month than I ever had in my, my, my Christian life. And then I think, man, is that an indictment against my, my prayer life? <laughs> we only pray when a crisis comes. Well, I pray all the time. Hey, but especially when crisis come, it ought to drive us to the Lord in prayer. Here's Jehoshaphat. He had done wrong. He had aligned himself with Ahab. But there was still good in him. And when the crisis came, he stopped to pray. Folks, I believe that will be the first thing we do. Many times it's the last thing we do, but it ought to be the first. You know, usually in a crisis, one of the first things we ask is, what's going on? I ask that question. What's going on? What am I going to do? But our first thing that we should do would be to go to the Lord. So many times we turn everywhere but to God. Do we not? We'll go to our friends. We'll say, and it'll be good friends. Godly friends. Close associations. And some will come. And we'll go tell them all about it. We'll tell them all about our problems at the end of it. Say, oh, will you pray for me? But all we really wanted to do was just tell somebody about our problems. But the main thing we should want, would, would you pray for me? But we go everywhere. We go to our friends. We go, uh, uh, we go to the doctors. We go to the, the psychiatrist, the psychologist. We go, to the, we go to the First National Bank to bail us out. And, and oh, listen, folks, when crisis comes, the first thing, the first thing we ought to do is go to the Lord. Seek the Lord in prayer. I believe there is a message for us in this today oh can you think of times in your life folks when crisis came and you just sought the lord you just prayed and prayed and prayed that's what we should do god wants us to pray he said in luke chapter 18 and verse 1 and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Oh, do we pray that way, folks? Do we pray that way? In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, that's the word of God. That's God's instruction to us. We ought to pray. I want you to listen to what God says about prayer in the scripture. Praying in a crisis. Uh, we're exhorted to pray in a crisis. In James chapter 5 in verse 13, the Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. We ought to pray in crisis that God would consider our trouble in Psalms 9, in verse 13, have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. We ought to pray in a crisis for the presence and support of God. The Bible says in Psalms 102, in verse 2, Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am troubled. Incline thine ear unto me in the day. When I call, answer me speedily. We ought to pray in crisis for divine comfort. In Psalm 19, 119, verse 76, Let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness, be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Oh, we ought to pray in a crisis for relief of our troubles. In Psalms 39, 2, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. Oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. We ought to pray for deliverance in Psalms 25, 17. The trouble of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distress. We ought to pray for pardon and for deliverance from sin. Psalms 39, 8, deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. 
Psalms 51, 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindnesses, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And there go my notes. <laughs> I was, uh, Brother Schwanky was here one day, and he was preaching, and uh, he had his, his iPad out. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, he had his notes on his iPad. And I could tell because he, he was looking down and he could see that blue tint coming. Afterwards, I said, Brother Swank, I said, what in the world are you going to do if that battery ever goes dead in that thing? He said, well, I guess I'll have to depend on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We're talking about prayer, prayer and praying in crisis. Oh, we are pray that we may be turned to God. I've surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. Thou hast chastened me, and I was chastened as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Oh, we look at we ought to pray for divine teaching and direction. We ought to pray that our faith will increase. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> oh, I found myself saying that a lot these, that, these past weeks. Lord, I believe. Lord, just help my unbelief. Just help me just keep believing. We ought to pray for mercy in Psalm 6 and verse 2. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. We ought to pray for restoration of joy in Psalms 51, 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Folks, we go on and on and on. There's so much about prayer in the Bible. So many things we can pray that the, in the time of crisis, Lord, do this for me, do this for me, do this for me. There's a prayer, there's a verse for everything that we go through. Prayer ought to be one of the first things we do. He prayed, number one. Second, look at what he did second. He recognized the power of God. Look at verse six. And said, O oh Lord, our God, uh, excuse, oh, and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? O oh, Jehoshaphat recognized the power of God. Oh, listen, folks, we serve a powerful God today. And you and I ought to recognize that. I look at today, and it amazes me sometimes, the power of technology today. I, I'm, I, I believe it's a sign of the end times, I really do. We've been talking about that on, on Sunday nights. Tonight we'll pick that up again. Uh, but but just, the, just the reach of technology today. Oh, what, what, what man can do with technology. We take our cell phones and, 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 and this little thing we hold in the palm of our hand, man, we can go anywhere in the world in a click. You Google anything you want to Google and it's before your eyes in a matter of no more than seconds. The power of technology that to today we have the power of science, true science. There's a lot of science so-called today, and it's powerless, but true science today, the power of it. Oh, you know, they're flying drones around on the face of Mars today. How about that? That's pretty neat, isn't it? Power of medicine today. Technology, I, I'm amazed they can draw a little vial of blood and the things that they can tell about you by just taking a little vial of blood from your body today. It's amazing. I learned so much when I went through leukemia. I got an education in medicine. I can tell you things that maybe some, well, maybe some of you nurses, and maybe you all know some of it. But I can tell you things that you, that you don't know because I studied it. 
It's amazing what they can do, what they can tell you. But I'm tell you what, folks, that's nothing compared to the power of God today. The power of God that gave man technology to know science and medicine and technology. The, 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 the God who made the brain that man has puffed himself up against the God that gave them the brain that they have. Oh, what a powerful God that we have today. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. I'm, I'm amazed, folks. Uh, the power of God today. Uh, I'm standing before you today and I'm preaching a message from the Bible. I'm going to tell you what, only the power of God can do that. Uh, my sufficiency is of the Lord. My breath this morning is from the Lord. Your breath is from the Lord. And if you get another one, it'll be because God gives it to you. Our sufficiency is of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Listen, folks, everything that we have today comes from God. And happy will be the day when you and I realize that. That everything that we are, everything that I hope to be comes from the Lord I wrote this down some time ago. It says this. I don't know where I got it from. It says, The task ahead of us is never greater than the power of God in us. The task ahead of us is never greater than the power of God that is in us. And folks, that's so true today. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm drying up. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, folks, biologically speaking, uh, that was impossible. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Not at all. In Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17, the Bible says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. You think about it, folks, this ball that we're standing on today, God made that. We talked about flying a drone on Mars. Hey, listen. We ain't even reached the back of his, the tip of his backyard yet. You look out through there and it's vast. And God made it. And he not only made it, he holds it in the palm of his hand. That's our God. The power of our God. The Bible says, for with the Lord nothing shall be impossible. That's the power of our God. Power is one of his attributes. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. God's power is expressed in his voice in Psalms 29.3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord uh, uh, is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord upon many waters. I, folks, I'll tell you, it's just something about standing at the ocean and listening to the waves roar as they come in. I love to go up and stand at the point of Niagara Falls and listen to the water rolling over Niagara Falls. There's just something about the, the power of it. And God compares the voice of the Lord is upon many waters. The glory, the, uh, the, the God of glory thundereth and, and, and vomited the, the, the voice of the Lord. I mean, it's going to be something, folks, one of these days when we hear his voice. Now, we hear it today. We hear that still, small voice. He speaks to us through his word. The spirit of God ministers the word of God to our hearts. Oh, but one of these days, folks, we're going to hear his voice. And what a voice it'll be. It'll be a voice of power. The power of God is expressed through his voice. 
The power of God is expressed through His finger. In Psalms 8 and verse 3, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. The hand of God is expressed through His hand. In Psalms 48, 13, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. The voice of the Lord is expressed through His arm. The power of God is expressed through the arm of God. In Psalms 52 and verse 10, The Lord hath made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of of our God. What power when God stretched out his arms on Calvary and paid for the sin of the world. Oh, no other power could do that, folks. If you ever make it to heaven and if you know Jesus Christ as your, uh, as your Savior, you will. If you've been washed in his blood, you'll stand before him one day because of his mighty stretched out arm. The power of God is everlasting. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And folks, I could go on and on. I got lots of ver verses on the power of God, but maybe that's enough this morning. You and I need to recognize the power of God in a crisis. Crises are going to come in our lives, folks. Oh, but I serve one who's all-powerful. Listen, my sufficiency is of Him. I have no strength, folks. I'm nothing. I am nothing. I am what I am, but by the grace of God. And you are what you are, but by the grace of God. If it wasn't for God's grace, you'd be just like any other uh, uh, low-life, degenerate sinner that's in the world today. And we look at it, a lot of times we look down our nose at them. But by the grace of God, if it wasn't for God's grace, that'd be you and me too. Oh, the power of God. We need to recognize His power today. Then I believe third thing, we need to recall past victories. Back over in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, look at verse 7. And I like this. Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? Oh, what's Jehoshaphat doing? He's just looking back into the past and saying, God, this is what you have did in the past. These are the victories that you gave to us in the past. We went into the land. We drove out the inhabitants of the land. And you gave it to us for an inheritance. That was victory that you gave us. Jehoshaphat's looking past, looking back at past victories. I'm going to tell you what, folks. I look back into my past. I see a lot of failures along the way. And I imagine if you're honest with yourself, you can see failures in your past too. We don't need to get caught up in those failures. Yeah, they're there and they teach us. Yeah, this is where I failed in the past. Don't want to go down that road again. I see what happened there. But then I think about the victories that God's given us. Oh, well, I'll look back and see the victories that God has given you. Hey, could you look this morning and say, and, and I mean, just in a... In an instant, this is what God did for me in the past. Well, every one of us be able to say, God, thank you for what you've done for me in the past. Remember the past victories. Here's the thing, can't, can't just live on the past victories either. Look back and I think about them and, and I praise the Lord for it. I thought about this week and uh, well, yeah, maybe it was this week and, and a lot of you... Uh, weren't here when we got this building. And uh, man, we'd been looking for a church. You know the history of this church. We'd looked at several properties and several church buildings. And, and we thought, well, that we'd get this one. We'll get, and all of them fell through and uh, fell in. And then when we began looking at this one, I walked in the front door and I thought, man, this is it, Lord. This is home. This is where you're going to have us to be. And we wanted this place. And we began to pray and... and um, uh, I thought about this week, uh, one day Kevin and I came over here, and, and uh, where am I? Uh, the here, okay. There's a tree out there in the back of this lot. And Kevin and I came over, we'd walk around the property, and we'd pray around this property, and there's it, it's still standing out there. And I went out there and sat around that tree this week, and I prayed, 
I said, God, you've been good to us. You gave us this land. That tree's still standing there that Kevin and I sat around. We prayed around. And I sat around that tree, and I began to remember all that God had done for us. What a special time that was. Oh, God, you've been good in the past. Won't you be good in the future, too? We can't live on either one. We can't get caught up in the failures. But we can, we can be instructed by both. And we should. Oh, our God's good. He's always been there for me, folks. He's always been there for me. I wish I could say I've always been there for Him. But He's been there for me. No, I think at times, low times in my life, and crying out to the Lord, God always comes through. He always does. It doesn't always have to be like I think it should be. But He's always been there for me. And I believe He always will be. Let me give you a fourth thing. And I'll move rather quickly now. He got His eyes upon the Lord. Look at verse 12. He got His eyes upon the Lord. Oh, our God, wilt Thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah, Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Oh, I don't know, folks. Try to get the picture of the scene. Oh, the, this great army's coming out against them. We don't know what to do, but we're going to get our eyes upon the Lord. And they get, they get all, uh, Judah, they come out and they come with their wives and their little ones and they're standing before the Lord. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, Lord. I'll tell you what, folks, that's a great place to get our eyes are upon the Lord. Our eyes are upon God. Who else are we going to go to? I'm talking about folks when it gets as bad as it gets and there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> we can go to the Lord. We can get our eyes on Him. Listen, folks, man will fail you. Man will fail you every time. You know, folks, there are people that are sitting out of church today because some man failed them. And I don't want to discount anybody's situation that maybe you faced in time past. But that's no reason to quit on God. God will never fail us. Finances will fail you. Man will fail you. If it's in this life, if it's not of God, if it's not God Himself, it can fail you. You look down at verse 15. They got their eyes on the Lord and uh, our eyes are upon thee, Lord. What are we going to do? Look down at verse 15, if you would. And there stood one up and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor be dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the city of cliff of Ziph, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You know what, folks? They're standing there and they're saying, Lord, what are we going to do? Our eyes are upon you. And somebody stood up and spoke for God. And I believe God's still looking for men and women to stand up today and speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's a crisis. I know things are bad. But I want to just give a word for God. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in the midst of a crisis. Somebody stood up for God. Look at verse 18. 
And Jeho Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord and worshipped the Lord. They're all together. Jehoshaphat and his court, the men with their wives and their children, and they all together bow and begin to worship the Lord. Hey, listen, folks, nobody in this church is an island. I'm the pastor of this church. And sometimes people say to me, they'll, they'll say, Preacher, you know your church. And then whatever comes after. I'm quick to stop them and say, Listen, folks, this is not my church. This is God's church. He allows you and I to be a part of it. And each of us have a, a part in this church. Oh, listen, folks, we need to bow together and worship the Lord. Well, I'll go home and worship the Lord on my property. Or I'll go down to the river. I'll worship God on the golf course. No, you can't. Not on Sunday. We need to come together. And we need to worship the Lord. We need to realize we're in a crisis. We need to seek the Lord. We need to seek His face. We need to bow before Him together and worship Him. We need to come together and pray. We need to do this as a body. You see, we're all in this together. Today, it's somebody else. Tomorrow, it may be somebody in your family. And we're all in this together. And they bow together and they worship. Look at verse 20, uh, if you would. Look down at verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. So shall ye prosper. They had faith. Listen, folks, they had faith. Where's your faith? You have faith, but where is it? I've looked at this crisis that we're in, and I've had faith that God's going to bring our people home. And I'm going to keep on having it, folks. And if you don't bring them home to us, you'll take them home to Him. But one way or the other, they're going to get home. Right, at Brother Al? <laughs> One way or the other, they're going to make it home. But I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to believe. Believe the Lord. Believe His prophets was the word. Do we have faith to believe? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross and despised the shame is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. I got to this some time ago. I'm going to read it this morning, a little example of having faith. A young man was once walking along a narrow road on top of a cliff. Not excited about being on such a narrow road, but knowing there was no other way around, he carefully made his way closer to the other side. Sure enough, though, he lost his footing and fell off the cliff. Thankfully, he grabbed hold of a branch nearby which saved him from a long fall to his death. He called out for help from the road where he just was. Is anyone up there? Suddenly he heard a voice say, I'm here. I'm the Lord. Do you believe in me? The man replied, I believe in you, Lord. I really do, but I can't hold on much longer. The voice stated, well, if you really believe in me, then you have nothing to worry about. Let go of the branch and you'll be fine. How many of you are ready to turn loose the branch? Let go, you'll be fine. The man paused for a minute, then yelled, Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> That's sort of the way we live our life sometimes, isn't it? Lord, we believe you. We believe you. We have faith. We have faith. But then in a crisis, is there anybody else out there? Folks, just keep believing. Don't give up. Whatever, whatever your crisis may be. You look down at verse 22. And when they begin to sing, to, uh, to sing and to praise... I think that's important. 
when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. God gave the victory, folks. When they began to praise, the Lord sent ambushments. Now, you, you, this picture here, you know, the, the battle's coming. We're not to fight. Well, this is God's battle. Just have faith. Just believe God. And here they come. Whoa. Just believe God. And then they begin to sing and to praise. And when God's people begin to sing and praise, the Bible says the Lord sent ambushments. And then the armies begin to fight amongst one another and kill themselves. Listen, folks. There's no way to account for this. There's no way to account for this. Why would the armies turn against their, themselves? Here's God's people. They're standing. The, the, the battle's coming. And they just begin to sing and just praise the Lord. Oh God, I want to say to you this morning that you've been so good to us. And we praise your holy name. For all that you've done. You're worthy today. All power, all glory, all honor beyond, belongs to Him. And as they all together and as one voice begin to praise the Lord, the Lord sent ambushments. There's no way to count before. There's no thunder. There was no hail. There was no sword of an angel. There was no sword of a man. They didn't do this in the arm of their own strength. There was no surprise attack. There was no alarm that sound, sounded that scared the armies. They just began to praise the Lord. And God sent an ambushment. And I'm not sure what that was. I'm going to find out one of these days. But God did it, folks. How did they win the battle? The battle was God's. can't try to handle these crises by ourselves, folks. If we do, we're going to make a mess of it. In the darkest hours, we need to learn to pray. We need to recognize the power of God. Let's recall past victories that God's given to us. He's still God, is He not? He's still on the throne, is He not? Yes, yes, He is. He's still the same God He's always been. Get our eyes upon the Lord. Let's begin to sing and praise the Lord. And then let's just watch and see what victories God brings our way. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. And nobody's looking around. Folks, we all have crises in our life. And those crises can be any number of things. They take many different forms. But in the end, how are we going to handle them? You're going through some crises in your life today. Maybe it's sort of a dark hour. We need to learn to pray. We need to learn to recognize God's power. Let's recall those past victories. Let's get our eyes upon the Lord. And when we get our eyes upon the Lord, I believe we'll begin to, to sing praise to Him. And then just stand back and see what God does.